Brantley Snipes is the owner of Brantley Sites Snipes Landscape in Sunshine in Greenwood, Mississippi. Brantley graduated with a degree in horticultural science from Auburn University and then headed to North Carolina State University and graduated in 2011 with a dual master's degree in landscape architecture and horticultural science. Plant nerd. Um, seeing a need for quality design and innovative projects within the Mississippi Delta, Brantley returned there in 2011 to launch her company. Brantley has served as executive director of Main Street Greenwood since 2012. Um, these are the things that I want you to know about Brantley. Number one, she is a Main Street badass. I'm going to say that publicly. Main Street hero for me. Um, she has a great playlist. If you ever get the opportunity, yes. quit her own music. She's really great at it. She's the best person to sit beside at a restaurant because she always orders the best food. <laughs> And if the plant nerd thing doesn't work out in Main Street, she should be a line dance instructor because she can move food with me all over. So, great nice. Can y'all hear me okay if I kind of project doubts in the front? I don't like to do that. Uh, I'm going to kind of bounce back and forth. Jay said, uh, I'm a landscape architect, but I'm also a Main Street director, so I wear a lot of hats. Uh, I have three passions in life, two of which we're hearing about today uh, plants and soil preservation. If I'm your second choice today, go to session A, got canceled, you're welcome, I'm glad you're here. <laughs> <laughs> if I start to talk too fast, y'all just hold your hand up because when I get excited about things and we talk quick. So try to get us out of here because everybody can go have a delicious lunch. Uh, as Jamie said, I take food very seriously, so I'm not going to stand between anyone and a lunch break today. So, raise your hand if you are a member of a garden club, a civic club, a rotary club, a professional sorority, any of these civic engagement groups that we have. Great. And how many of you work with these if you are in one and they have the best of intentions for your downtown? I'm not throwing any community under the bus. If I throw any under the bus, it would be Greenway. The whole premise of this Talk came about uh, the Greenwood Garden Club call, which I'm a member of, full disclosure, uh, and said, hey, we got a grant, and we want to do a pink flower bed in downtown Greenwood. The whole grant is called Pink at Pink. I said, great. Right. That sounds like a fantastic idea. Who's going to do it? How are we going to take care of it? Why does it have to be pink? Nothing else in town. Is pink. Um, well, that's a really good question. But we got $1,500 to do this project. What are we going to do? Okay, fair. Okay. You just sometimes you're not going to argue. So, that kind of got us talking about creating landscape plans for our community. Um, again, I will throw Greenwood under the bus more than any other community. We don't have a ton of downtown landscaping. You know why? Because the Main Street Director is a landscape architect, and I understand how much work goes into maintaining downtown landscape and watering containers and hanging baskets and stuff like that. So, every great landscape starts with a plan. It doesn't matter what landscape in history it was, there has to be a plan. You can't just say, huh, we can put some planter boxes out here. You really need to develop a plan. And to develop a plan, you kind of have to start with asking some very key questions. For example, who are we designing for? Are your retailers saying, man, we really could use a lot of color down here? Or your visitors saying, well, I don't know, it's hot. You know, it's hot in the south in the summer. Street trees would really be an added benefit. Uh, other issues could be we need to hide some unsightly issues that we're having down here. We've got some happy utility boxes. Uh, we really need to help direct traffic. Uh, how are we going to implement this? All in start with how. That's the immediate question I go to. How are we going to implement it and how in the hell is it going to be maintained? Because <laughs> guess what? <laughs> landscapes grow. It's not that you're just building something. A landscape is a dynamic, evolving process that happens over time. So, how? All in start with how. How are you going to do this? How are you going to take care of this? I always say, let's figure out the back end of the project before we start on the top end and say, great, we want to do containers. Go to that how question. 
Where are we going to land today? Huh? They just told me. Oh, okay, sorry. All right, never mind. We're back behind the podium. Um, where, where were we? Where are you going to be landscaping? All right, is your entrance into downtown tacky? Do you have an empty sign? Do you have some bulbs and um, some bulb outs and medians that you need to be planting on? And another question is, when are you going to do the work? A lot of times when these civic organizations receive grants, there are strict timelines that they have to hit. Well, guess what? You can't install a landscape at every month. You have certain windows in which to get plants in the ground in order for them to be sustainable and viable. So guess what? If that garden club has a grant and it's due August 1st and you have to have it installed in July in the heat of the Mississippi Delta, it's probably not going to live. So that free $1,500 has now become a maintenance dead nightmare that you, as the Main Street director, are going to have to put up with because you're going to get all the phone calls about it. Uh oh. Which one, Randy? <laughs> oh, wait, hang on. Okay. Common landscape areas that we might have. Y'all, this is hard sitting behind a podium. I'm sorry. Um, containers, as we've talked about. Sidewalks. What are your little sidewalk strips that you might have downtown? Bulb outs and medians. These are plants like down here at the bottom where you kind of bulb out around your parking areas to provide shade and a little pops of color throughout your downtown. Screens are a huge part of downtown landscaping. We've all got some pretty ugly stuff we need to hide. So there are dumpsters, there are utility boxes, there are all kinds of things that could really benefit from evergreen screens and things like that. Hanging baskets are another option. Kind of go along with containers. Hanging baskets are tough because guess what? You're hanging plants in the air and guess what the air does? Dries them out. So not trying to discourage anybody from a hanging basket, but again, we're going to talk about having a plan for that. So for instance, this is a tale of three fire hydrants that I like to show all within a bulb out within different communities across Mississippi. We're not going to name names. You can see two out of the three of them. You really see one of them. So these are prime examples of, you know what, you can't really cover a fire hydrant, but they're not the prettiest things to look at. So how do we mix them into our bulb outs and planted areas to kind of hide them, but yet still let the fire department know it's there. This community used an ornamental grass, which is really easy to access. You can knock it down and get to the fire hydrant rather easily. So things to consider. All of these have beautiful, all of these communities have beautiful downtown landscaping, but you can kind of see different approaches to how they might address certain utility issues. Other things to consider before you start just sticking landscapes in, um, your traffic patterns. You really don't want to stick things out into traffic. You also don't want to block signs. This is a great example of a community. You can really see, you can see the street sign, you can see the stop sign. I think this is a yield pedestrian sign. And you can see that they did low landscaping around it so that you're not impeding views in and out of traffic. Traffic is a huge part that we have to pay attention to. Not just cars, but your pedestrian traffic as well. What's comfortable at the pedestrian scale? Also your local architecture. A lot of our communities have awnings and overhangs which provide shade, which is great. But it's also not necessarily great if you're trying to get trees because guess what? That tree and that awning are not going to coexist happily together. So take a look at your architecture and see what's around and look at the context before you really dig in to your landscape. Any questions so far? We good? Talking too fast? No? All right. Here's the key thing. If you're writing stuff down, I want you to write this down. The right plant in the right place. This is the number one mistake that we do when we are doing any kind of downtown landscaping, and I see it all the time. Um, oftentimes a plant, again, back to the fact that plants grow, we pop a little plant in and it's fine. 20 years later, it's hanging off the side of a building. Um, so guess what? Somebody 
probably the Main Street director, because we have to do everything, is having to cut that tree and trim it, not just once a year, but multiple times a year. So it's adding to your workload and adding to things that you really need to be doing elsewhere, but instead, you're pruning the giant holly on the side of the building. Same thing with this little juniper in front of this municipal building. That thing would hang over that sidewalk. That's a sidewalk right there. So guess what? Somebody has to come shear that juniper hedge multiple times a year. And when they do it, you get really ugly views of the plant. You get weeds starting to pop in because you're letting sunlight into a spot that's not supposed to be there. And you've just got a maintenance nightmare. Another favorite of mine is planting the tree under the power line. And guess who really doesn't care where a plant is? The power company when they come through there. So y'all start looking around and you'll start to see many, many trees. This is a beautiful ginkgo. It should be full, bright yellow leaves in the fall. And instead, it's planted right under the power line. Another one is a boxwood overhanging a sidewalk. So guess what? That boxwood is taking over half of that sidewalk. Again, it's constant attention to detail that you are gonna to have to maintain because you didn't really think about the growth habit of a boxwood before you stuck it in the ground within your community. These are all very common good plants. Guess what? They're in the wrong spot. So you need to look at the full context like we've been talking about before you stick plants in the ground. This is one of my favorites. Now, I will say this was taken. I'm not going to say where it was taken, but it was taken at another Destination Downtown event. This, you can't really see it, is an Iliagnus bush. Iliagnus is a great screen. And guess what? They had the right idea because they are screening this big stormwater ditch in this area. Now, granted, this isn't downtown, but it's still a prime example because we were staying at the hotel to get to the conference downtown. Well, guess what? They can only prune this front part of the Iliagnus because the head shears don't reach to this back part right here. And so unless you are death-defying city worker and think you need to come back and prune, that's not going to get pruned. So guess what? It's going to look a little half-assed, you know? <laughs> they could have done many other plants in this place. Again, the idea is there. The screen, Iliagnus is a great screen. But when you drop about 30 feet into the ditch and you can't prune the backside of it, it doesn't necessarily work. <laughs> Again, we're going back to check all the context and surroundings. This is a great example of a lower pedalum to hide a utility box. We've got a lot of these downtown. Not our most sightly things that we look at, but they're part of it. However, said lower pedalum is now hiding the handicap sign, I'm standing in a handicap spot. There's a handicap sign hidden right there. It has grown over that, it has grown over the sidewalk, and it has eaten the holly bush right in front of it. So again, great plant, good idea, maybe not the best execution of all three, three things put together. Because guess what? Somebody's gotta come in and cut this back multiple times off the sidewalk within downtown. Another thing that we're kind of starting to see a lot of with the use of landscape plants is sometimes what was right is not right anymore. We see this in terms of plant vitality. There are two blights going around right now and it's from overuse of plants. One is an Indian hawthorn blight. So if you have Indian hawthorns in your community and they look like this, guess what? They're done for, time to get them out. There is a bacteria blight that has been knocking them out. The same thing is going with boxwoods. It's a blight that's happening and it's wiping them out. And you'll see it happen in one. This blight probably happened on this and has spread over this way. The kicker with this is at the same time, it kind of looks like what we call dog TT disease, where if you're downtown and you have downtown residents, dog TT will burn up a boxwood. It's just a common fact. And so it looks like this. So if you've got this, but it's just at the bottom of a boxwood, it may be your downtown residence black lab that's decided to mark on the boxwood right there. If it's on the top of the plant, higher than what a dog, I mean, we all know physics and where a dog can like <laughs> land on a plant. If it's higher in the plant, it's gonna be the blight and it's gonna spread and eventually all those boxwoods are gonna be done for. So guess what? They've got to come out. This is no other thing 
then we've just we've over planted these plants the wet conditions that we had this spring everything kind of plays into it so don't sit there and be like I mean it's probably gonna come back if your plant looks like that it's dead <laughs> so we've talked about place we've talked about looking at context we've kind of talked about where we're gonna do things and now let's kind of dig down into plants because there are a million bajillion plants in the entire world uh, there are four main uh, characteristics that you need to look at when it comes to a plant. The size, light requirement, your wet dry conditions, and your hardiness zone. And y'all are all probably like, well God, how do I find that out? Guess what? It's on the plant. So when you get a plant, it comes with a tag that tells you all of these main things that go along with your plant. The other thing, which is another key important thing, have y'all ever noticed that a palm tree doesn't grow in the mountains and a Christmas tree doesn't grow on the beach? It's this little thing called hardiness zones. And the USDA has been nice enough to break out hardiness zones uh, for us on a map. This is becoming a problem because nationwide chains and garden centers are not paying attention to the hardiness zones and they are introducing plants from Minnesota and maybe selling them down in Mississippi. Guess what? That's not necessarily going to work. So, y'all see where we all are, right here. So, that very north corner of Arkansas is going to be the coldest tolerance that we can get within plants. So, I always say just start with your hardiness zone because that's going to give you your plants that have your most vital, are able to live within our range. Know your place. Know where this plant is going and check out the size. Guess what? When you buy that plant at a garden center, God, back, sorry. When you buy that plant at a garden center, it's in a little tiny three gallon pot and it's about a third of the size that it's going to be when it grows. So when you pay attention to those tags, look at the full plant height that it's going to be and plan your landscapes around full plant sizes, not what they are when they come from the nursery. Where you're planting, you need to look at the sun shade requirements. You need to see, are we looking at a full sun problem? Are we looking at a full shade problem? Are we looking at an area that holds moisture? The number one plant killer is too much moisture, which everybody's probably like, no, no, really, it's too much moisture. We love to water stuff, and we love to not prepare beds to get the drainage properly for plants. If you have a wet spot, guess what? There are plants that can tolerate more wet conditions than more dry conditions. When in doubt, go local. Go to your local nurseries, go to your local landscapes, landscapers, go to your horticulturist. Notice I'm not saying go to your local landscape architect. I'm a landscape architect. Guess what? We're not all trained in plant knowledge. So we're real good at design. Not all of us carry the plant knowledge that we need. So if you're going to hire one, make sure that they have an understanding of your plants within your area. We had a firm come in and do some work in Greenwood and they specced dogwoods to go in this project we were working on. Well, according to the map, dogwoods would work great in Greenwood, but if you know the delta and you know that we have wet soil most of the year and a dogwood doesn't like wet feet, then guess what? A dogwood's not going to grow there. And if you would have talked to a local person, you would have understood that a little bit more. Any questions on plants? I get real fired up about plants, as Jamie said. <laughs> um, so how do you tell that garden club that wants to do a full pink bed, hey, that doesn't really fit in with what we're trying to do. Start with creating a plant palette. Come up with a list of shrubs, come up with a list of perennials, a list of trees that really reflect what your community is trying to do. Is there a color that you're trying to convey that goes with your branding? Is there a type of plant? For instance, do you want to focus more on evergreen plants? Do you want to focus more on blooming plants? Do you want to focus more on native plants? New Albany, Mississippi has an awesome native plant nursery um, and I'm pretty sure Billie Jean's been working with them on getting some natives involved. That's a whole another topic for another day or native plants. We're not even going to drip into that. Ease of maintenance can influence your plant palette. What's going to be easy for you to take care of? Um, and then again, location because not all plants are going to fit the exact same spot across your board within your area. So think about this. Go back to those questions before you just start putting pots on Main Street and say 
what are we really wanting to convey? Are we wanting to convey bright, sunny happiness that these communities are doing? Are we wanting to convey more eclectic? Are we wanting to convey, you know, that we like to do whatever you like to do in your community? Um, things to think about. If you're a Mississippi Main Street, you will be getting this. This is an actual publication that we are working on right now, but this is an example of a plant palette that we have put together for our Mississippi Main Street communities. And so this is shrubs, um, and you can see that we put a few little quick blivets about that. Evergreen, blooming, sun, shade, it can fit all zones within Mississippi. Now, I didn't go into sizes and stuff like that because guess what? You got your main plants and then you got your plants that have cousins. So within the camellia species, there are hundreds of varieties of camellias. So we kind of stayed broad like that. Some no-nos that people are still insisting on using within <laughs> the landscape. <laughs> Raise your hand if you've ever dealt with wisteria. <laughs> yep. Wisteria is one of the most vigorously growing vines and will topple a wooden structure if you have one downtown. So don't think that you've got like a cute little pergola in your downtown pocket park and you're going to put a wisteria on there because guess what? That pergola is going to be gone in about five years. Um, another one, I call this the um, Asiatic Yopon. This is Asiatic Jasmine and it was a big trend back in the day. We would plant that as a ground cover and then you would put your shrubs around it and guess what? That Jasmine jumps into the shrub and there's a spot in Greenwood where they just, they're pruning it all to be the same. So it's this combination shrub of Yopon and Jasmine like that. So be very careful if you are going to do a ground cover and put anything else. If you are doing a ground cover within your community, that needs to be the only thing in that space. The lovely Bradford pear. We loved those a long time ago. Guess what? That beautiful spring flowering tree after 10 years starts to bend and break and they're all having to be taken down across the state. I see it all over the place. Um, the other, and then this is the Chinese privet. This was another spring blooming. We planted a lot of it. Great evergreen. Guess what these two are doing in our native landscapes? decimating them. Nobody will ride in the car with me in the month of April, May, because all I talk about are Bradford pears and all of the empty lots across Mississippi. So um, just notice it, start to look around, you'll be like, huh, that's a blooming tree in that empty lot. And guarantee you there's a Bradford pear and they're just colonizing and they're taking over. So be mindful of that before you're planting stuff and look at all of the characteristics that these plants carry. Some quick, there are lots of design principles out there. I pulled some that I felt were very applicable to a downtown landscape. Um, simplicity, keep it simple, kiss it. Y'all know that saying. Um, you don't want to have a million different options. You want that palette to be very simple. You want it to be have a variety though. You want to look at color, texture, um, you know, smell, any things like that that can offer a variety within your plant palette. Repetition, another principle. So you can see we've got color repeated through here. We've got textures repeated. You've got a fine texture down here and a fine texture up here. Um, this was a snippet of a much longer bed. Um, sequence. So when I say sequence, think in layers. You want to think of like a top-down layer coming this way and a layer coming this way. So it's a vertical and a horizontal layering that you're trying to do to kind of, and that, you can use that technique to really direct eyes away from unsightly things and really kind of frame views and vistas within your downtown. Always plant in odd numbers. It's just a technique, just odd numbers. You're not going to make four of anything look good, I hate to tell you. Um, You'll do one, threes, fives. So when you start to kind of develop your plan, think about that. Because y'all are going to have the tools when we leave here to know exactly what you need to do within your landscape. So this is one community within Mississippi. Uh, you can see that they have the repetition of the street trees. This is all a Chinese elm that they've got. They've got variety in color. So you've got whites, greens, reds. Um, kind of mixed throughout. And then you've also got the simplicity of the same 
patterns and looks. And this is a container that they have locally designed. And this is repeated not only in all the medians, but also throughout all little spots of downtown. So you know kind of they have marked the downtown with the use of these awesome kind of globe, that's one up at the top, globe containers that they're doing. So they've kept it simple. They've kept the same idea. They've kept a lot of the palette. But then they've also offered variety of colors throughout downtown. All right, so let's talk about, let's chat about some containers real quick. I do. Containers are great. They make downtown look fantastic. These are some of my favorite ones um, that I've come across over the years. Containers for downtown need to be durable. Guess what? There's a lot of plastic containers out there that you can get for cheap that might look like concrete. But after a summer in the UV light of the Deep South, they're not going to last. So guess what? You're going to have to throw them out and start all over. If you're going to move forward with a container, consider a durable material and make that investment up front and look at concrete or steel or treated lumber. These are all better options uh, for your containers within the downtown realm. Uh, I like these examples because these containers, you can see this is a concrete container that blends well with the downtown brick pattern is really playing in well with the color palette. I loved how these guys are tying in with the red door uh, of that downtown retailer. These are a great example of hanging baskets, and I'm going to keep talking about there. That's on the next slide because they take exceptional care of watering these. And then these are multifunctional. This is a um, downtown restaurant, and the containers were used as part of the branding in the development of that. So the name of the restaurant is the Grumpy Rabbit. And so this one has carrot legs on the bottom of it to kind of help with branding. So containers are a good option to kind of help relay your community branding and tell that story that we're working on when creating a place. Factors to consider. This is the guy, again, not naming names of where we are, but uh, drainage, moisture, construction, budget, and maintenance. These are the top five things you need to consider before putting a container into your downtown. Um, the number one problem that I see with containers in the downtown fabric is drainage. They don't have holes in the bottom of them. So guess what? You plant it and it just sits in water and doesn't make it three weeks planted like that. Another thing, do you have a watering truck? Do you have a public works department that will get by there every morning and water those? Um, and we'll hit on construction in a minute, but Containers are also one of those things that need to be planted every year. So you can't just, this is not a one and done thing. You can make them a one and done thing by making sure you've got evergreen plant material in them and then you can change out annuals around it each year. But you, containers are, I see a lot of one and done. We planted a container, we're good. Um, think about the longevity of what that container looks like. This one was my favorite. This one stopped me in my tracks. This lady put a pineapple plant in her. So you're like walking down the street and you're like, oh my God, that's a pineapple. Um, and then it made me pay attention to what's in there. So containers are really good and get creative with what you're putting in them and drawing attention to your local retailers like that. They don't have to be a magical work of art. They can be as simple as some great Kimberly Queen ferns popped in there. It can be a one hit wonder on that. They're also a good opportunity to show some seasonality. These have some gourds popped in them, which we're coming in on gourd and pumpkin season, so they're a good kind of avenue for that. Um, these containers are doing great. They're serving on the boundary of a downtown pocket park. It's keeping people from walking in like that, so they're kind of used as an outer border like that. These are some of my favorites because they are creating an outdoor space while providing kind of a visual impact along there. And then again, these are the containers that are outside the Grumpy Rabbit. Um, and you can see the carrots are pulled back. They've got some planters on the backside of it too. So you can be creative with them. But again, make sure that you've got a plan for them in the long range. So some quick things on planters. This is kind of a two to three ratio that I use when establishing a planter. You need a lot of drainage holes, so just make sure you have adequate drainage. Drainage structure, this can be anything, you know, if you've got a container that's not gonna move, this can be river rock, this can be 
I've used mulch, something that's going to allow that water to move through there. You don't have to put expensive potting mix in this whole thing because guess what? Your roots of those plants are only going to hit this zone right here. So this needs to be something that allows water to pass through it on the bottom of like that. Um, I get made fun of this a lot, but it's kind of a fun thing to say. Containers have a thriller, a filler, and a spiller. Um, so your thriller is your tall, your high, your, your visually impacting uh, plant. I like to use an evergreen as a thriller, and then the fillers and spillers you can change out as annuals or perennials, or you could put some bulbs in there. You can make a container self-sufficient where it just handles itself and still looks good at different times of the year through the use of perennials and bulbs and that tall evergreen structure. So. Again, it can also be one simple plant within your container. It doesn't have to be all of these, but this is kind of the rule of thumb when you're creating a container. All right, so I bet y'all never thought that Biggie Smalls would be in the same presentation as one titled with your garden club, because we are going to talk about the South's most notorious plant, <laughs> the crepe myrtle. <laughs> I'll take a sip before we do this one. <laughs> How many of you have crepe myrtles? Yep. How many of you love a crepe myrtle? Oh, interesting. Okay, that's fair. Um, the notorious crepe myrtle is one of the South's most talked about, controversial, used uh, street tree, downtown tree that we have. Um, if you are a landscape client of mine, you have to beg to have one in your yard. I try not to do it. Um, these are some good examples of some crepes that are done correctly. Um, they have just finished blooming. They are beautiful. We can see why we overplanted them a lot. Um, crepe myrtles are trees. They should be treated as trees. They are not shrubs. They should not be nubbed or murdered, as we call it. This right here, guess where that is? That's in Greenwood. That happened in Greenwood. I did not have anything to do with it, but about wrecked my car. That's my car right there. You can see I'm like sticking out in traffic because I was like, oh man, we got to get a picture of this. This happened in July. This is not anything that should have happened ever. Uh, I mean, bless its heart. Look at that. You just feel so sorry for it. You're like, oh, buddy, you know, you could be great because guess who, the, guess who his neighbor is? That guy who hadn't been touched, and he is beautiful right there. So, if we're looking at sustaining your landscape and maintaining your landscape, your crepe myrtles do not have to be nubbed every year. That is just one more thing that is on your to-do list that does not have to happen. We do have lots of problems with crepes. Um, as great as they are, even if they are taken care of, you can see, I'm gonna come back to this, I'm gonna hit this slide in a minute, but they are nasty. Y'all, they drop all kinds of shit. And I'm sorry, I said shit, but it is, sh I mean, they drop blooms, they drop buds, they drop leaves, they drop bark, that's on my patio. Like, that is in my backyard. Like, it is not a pleasant experience, because guess what? They get on your shoes, and then they come inside, and you spend the whole summer months vacuuming. It's a great tree, and I'm not going to take it down because it gives a lot of shade, but damn. Uh, if not giving adequate space and allowed to grow, they bust up sidewalks. So that really big, pretty picture, that guy, that really pretty one, is doing that to the sidewalk. So not all that glitters is gold in terms of a crepe myrtle. The big problem that we are experiencing, again, so much of our disease with plants comes from the fact that they have been overplanted. Um, there is a lot of what we are calling, or is called, crepe, mark, crepe, mark, crepe myrtle bark scale. And it's this tiny white sooty material that is on your plants. You see it from afar, it looks like your crepe myrtle's gone black, like you turned the lights out on it. You're seeing this a lot. Um, it has moved in from Texas and is just slowly starting to take over crepe myrtles. And guess what? It's going to hit the ones that have not been taken care of quickest. So ones that have been nubbed, you can see the big knots on the bottom of this one. That scale has moved in because that crepe myrtle is on a struggle bus. You are not going to get an insect on a plant if it's not already struggling because insects are kind of lazy um, or smart when it comes to that. Um, this is kind of a quick 
proper pruning, if we're not going to nub it. The problems come when you let them grow on top of each other. You get these horrible scars within it. So this is a photo taken from this crepe or one next to it. And you can see how they all kind of overlap and intertwine like that. Your crepes should have three uh, main branches that come out of it, three main trunks. So what you do is you come in and you cut it back at the bottom. You cut back any suckers. You cut back anything that's about to cross into the next one, and then anything that is finger size needs to come out of that canopy. It needs to be opened up. It needs to let air through it. You'll get better blooms. You'll get less disease, and you'll have much better results on your crepes. The best time to prune is in the winter when it does not have that leaf structure on it, and you can really get in there and see. This is one we were trying to salvage that had been nubbed back, and it shot all these little shoots up. So it wasn't really acting like a tree. So we've kind of opened it up and we've been working to get it back in its full glory as that. Any questions on the crepe myrtle? Randy? How do you feel about the single stem crepe myrtle? I'm fine with them. I think they're good. Yeah. So they can also be, they're beautiful as a multi trunk, but you've seen them in Charleston and stuff, the older ones that have a single big trunk coming out of them and they're just as pretty like that. Jamie? Depends on when, if, what time of year you do it. If you get enough of the root ball when it's cold enough outside. So if you've got a big established one, you're going to need a pretty big root ball to be dug up with it. So that's going to need a lot of effort. A lot of times to do that, it's just cheaper to buy a new one. So, all right, since we're on pruning, we'll just keep popping on pruning. Um, these are kind of some quick sketches I did. This is light pruning. This is where you come in and just kind of give it a haircut, where you just take a little off the tips. Um, the renewal pruning is you come in and you take out the top one to two thirds of a shrub. Uh, a lot of these plants that I was showing that were overgrowing a sidewalk or creating kind of a barrier to circulation needed to be renewal pruned, where you take it all the way back. Um, if you have an evergreen hedge within downtown and you turn somebody loose, more than likely they're going to come in and do bloop, bloop, and you're going to have a bunch of bloop, 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 all the wrong side. If you are trying to grow an evergreen in a hedge, you draw an invisible line across the top of it and you come in and you take the top out so that all plants grow consistently and they're all at the same. You give them all the same chances at the start, kind of running from that. I have two major sayings, right plant, right place and proper pruning ain't pretty. So if you really need to get in and prune a shrub to make it, to reclaim it and make it do what it's supposed to do, you're gonna have to make it look really ugly first. So this is a boxwood hedge that was taken back and you can see all the top third of those boxwoods were out. It was bare as a bone, but guess what? In May, it was flush with new growth. It was off the sidewalk. It was back where it needed to be within. Now, this is a residence, but same concept. This is a tree that had gotten overgrown, and that thing is tacky as sin when we finished pruning it. But at that summer, it was full of purple blooms and back growing in the habit that it needed to be. So if you've got a spot like this in downtown, give everybody a fair warning, make them sign a waiver that they're not going to yell at you, as I do with clients, because I say, you know, this isn't going to be pretty, but it's going to be worth it. Because improper pruning is almost uglier than the initial proper pruning. So this is a snowball viburnum. These are awesome. They bloom in May. This one was pruned at the right time. This one was not. This one has one bloom. This one has 40 blooms. So you can see the importance of pruning correctly and pruning at the right time, which all goes back to us establishing a plan within your community. These, guess where that is, Greenwood? These were cut back at the wrong time. These are azaleas, which azaleas in April in the South are beautiful. They were cut at the wrong time. They've got six blooms on them, on that. So if you're not pruning correctly, the results are almost as detrimental as killing your plant. I see. All right, getting your plants in the ground. Uh, one of the main issues that I see with landscapes going in is that plants are planted too deep. Uh, you want the top of your root ball, which this is your plant and this is your root ball, you want the top of that root ball to be right flush with the top of the soil line. A lot of times people just fill it up 
just fill her up with dirt because it feels like they're doing something. Your plant root ball, your hole should be two times the width of the root ball. You want it wider to give it that space to break into. So you're going to dig a shallower hole, but it's going to be wider and you're going to pop it in and then your mulch is going to come in on top of it. So what you're doing is you're not suffocating that root zone with a lot of added dirt because roots need some air to breathe. Um, if you're doing trees, if you stake them and guy them to get them in the ground straight and hold them, after one growing season, make sure you have a plan to get it down. I mean, y'all, that like makes me tear up. Can you imagine? Like, I mean, that is just like tree abuse right there. Um, same thing right here. Those were put around that crepe to get it to grow straight. And now it's just like eating it. And these, I mean, plants are resilient, so it shouldn't kill them, but that's not a very sightly thing to look at within your downtown context. And that's at a shopping mall, so clearly we're not doing that because we're focusing on downtown, but y'all get the idea. Um, part of planning for your downtown landscapes is creating a routine maintenance schedule. Um, this needs to include weed control, this needs to include fertilizer, this needs to include mulching, this needs to make sure you're planting the right plant in the right place, um, and it also needs to be removing dead plant material. Um, it's amazing how much just dead, decay plant material that I see that could be just popped up quite quickly. Um, I can send you a copy of one, but you really kind of come in January, you look at doing stuff, February, March, and you kind of break it out month by month, and that helps you kind of plan and coordinate when stuff gets done. Also, most of the time we are working with hourly employees that need very set instructions, and if you have set instructions on a set day, we can send our city employees out and have them do the work um, with a little bit more guideline in place than, hey, go prune the shrubs. And they're like, well, I don't, when, where, how? You know, we figured all that out. But have a plan, have a schedule, and make sure all of this is being taken care of. Um, mulch is a huge thing that gets left off the table and not thought about. So if you're looking at installing part of your maintenance and part of your budget should include mulch application. Mulch helps us maintain moisture conditions, mulch keeps weeds down, um, mulch looks good. I mean, this is beautiful with these mulch rings coming through this downtown greenway right there. When you are applying mulch, mulch really only needs to be two to three inches above the root ball as we were talking about, and you need to try to not have it come in direct contact with that stem. Would y'all want to wear a turtleneck in July in Mississippi? Because I wouldn't. And if you put that mulch around that plant, you're just making it have a turtleneck around it, and it's going to eventually suffocate it. The other major problem, and I don't have a good photo of this. I've got to look for one. So if you see one, send it to me. But we call it the mulch volcano effect, and y'all have seen the trees that have it. And the mulch is piled up all the way around, and that is just not good. So. Most of the time, mulch is going to decompose and decay, so you're not having to remove it when you put fresh on there. But just be mindful of the fact that you really never need to go above two to three inches on any plant like that. These were just some common um, maintenance spots, photos that I took. Weed control and downtown cracks. That's a pretty low-hanging fruit that has a pretty impact that you can get in and kind of get some roundup on those. Um, but, uh, those are Indian hawthorns and you can see that they've been taken out. The green shrub right there is an azalea. Um, I think it's got some jasmine that's probably about to move in and take over right there. But getting the dead and blighted out, even if that was blank, it would look a lot better and a lot more welcoming than some dead shrubs. Um, this little bed has a little bit of some nut sedge, meaning it's probably staying a little wet. It's got a little bit of ground cover, just needs a little bit of TLC, most of which can be handled with some mulch applications like that. And then to recap, you can always go fake plants um, as this did. This was another showstopper I almost wrecked the car on. Um, I was like, oh my God, I've never seen a blue blooming tree. Turns out there's not one. They just put some fake trees in front of that Shoney's. Um, start with your plan. 
Know that landscapes are going to change and evolve, and you've got to have a plan for that. It's not a one and done process when you're landscaping for your community. Uh, right plant, right place. Know where you're putting them, know the context, know above ground, around ground, low ground, all of that. Um, use your plants to create not only beauty, but create function as well. You can really drive home some branding. You can guide some views into certain things, like that little pineapple plant made me take notice of that little retail shop. You can hide unsightly views, but you can do this in a way that's beautiful as well. Get your maintenance routine established. Um, so when that garden club calls and says, hey, we're gonna do a bed and just say, look, we can't fit anything else in the maintenance schedule. If y'all can provide how you're gonna maintain and take care of this place, then I'm happy for y'all to do that installation. And I'm gonna say it again, because if I get a tattoo, it will be this. Right plant, right place. Know your plant, know your place, and marry the two together. Any questions? Yes, ma'am. Hanging baskets. Hanging baskets. What about the self-watering? You know, the ones that... That's a great idea, yes. You can, I've, I haven't ever messed with them that much, but I know that people are having good luck with them, and it'd be worth the investment on that. So I think they're a great... And there's some self-watering containers out there now, too. And I think those are an excellent idea. Um, I think gator bags work great if you've got new little trees. Um, Y'all have seen these around Startful. It's the little green kind of garbage bag on the bottom of a tree that kind of keeps watering. So any technology like that that makes your life easier, I think it's very doable. But you still have to think about if it's self-watering, it's going to have a reservoir and making sure that the reservoir is filled up and that's part of your, your plan on that. Hey. Okay, I have two more questions. Okay. Yeah, I, I believe in pine straw. Um, here's why. Pine straw, over time, weaves together like a carpet. And so those panicles from the pine tree weave together. And so it doesn't allow as much weed to come through. That little weed can pop through two pieces of pine bark mulch where it might run into a fabric of pine straw over time. So we see much better weed control with pine straw over <coughs> pine bark. Okay, thank you. The second part of my question is I know everybody's had problems with the army worms and everything yes. this year and kind of know how to kill those. But what about lace bugs? We've got some azaleas in our downtown area and they have got, somebody told me they were lace bugs. Okay. I just noticed they were turning like a lime green. Yep. Color. So on the insect thing, the first thing, I mean, Clearly you can spray it. So there's gonna be a systemic herbicide that you're gonna spray on that azalea and when that little lace bug bites into it, it's gonna kill it. However, insects move in due to bad environmental conditions with your plants. So look back and make sure that that azalea, the soil's draining right. Azaleas don't like to be wet and the minute they start to feel sick is when the bugs move in. Now, we've had a lot of wet weather this year and we're seeing a lot of problems like that so what i would suggest on something like that is if you hadn't had problems with it in the past it's probably like this year's environmental condition and so i would spray them and then i would treat them with the fertilizer and get them off and running for the next year there's a um there's a it's a so a systemic is one that you spray and the plant absorbs it. And there's a great one that we use a lot called 7, S-E-V-I-N. It's a red bottle. You can get it at Lowe's. You can hook it up to your hose and just spray it on there real good. That's going to be your best bet against insects on a plant. What about rubber mulch? What's your take on it? Mm -mm. Don't do it. <laughs> uh, I have done it. And here's what happens with rubber mulch is... Great, you don't have to replace it year after year, but what happens when the leaves fall in the fall and it lands on the rubber mulch and you can't blow it off of there and you're blowing all the rubber mulch back. And so I think rubber mulch, again, is good in certain circumstances if you have a playground that does not have trees around it, which doesn't sound like a very fun playground, but again, thinking through the maintenance of what happens when you know, something happens and lands on top of it. And if it was natural mulch, 
you would mix it all together and it works to the betterment of your overall bed. But if you can't, you've got a mess and it's an expensive mess because that stuff is expensive. Anybody else? Hey. Yep. Great. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I bet um, what I would do would be I would I would hire an experienced tree service to come in and just really do a light pruning of everything and get dead limbs out, get small limbs out, really kind of open up the canopy so that it's not dropping. When it starts to drop stuff, it's just, it's, it's, it's old and it's getting rid of it. And so you could pay a tree service once a year to come in and kind of not top them out, but get up in the canopy and open it up and make sure that we're just back to the main trunks coming off of that. And that should help drop some of them. Now, if it's a river birch, I'm sorry, you're screwed. You're going to have to get them gone because there is nothing you can do about a river birch or a crepe myrtle on that. So, um, again, a lot of times if they've been planted for 30-something years, sometimes it's best just to put them out to pasture and start over. There's just sometimes you just have to do that. I, that's, that's not a popular opinion, but especially with boxwoods and azaleas that we've been inheriting since the 50s and 60s, there's just not a lot you can do. Thanks. Okay, great. Thank y'all. Oh, one more. What are your favorite trees and plantings for downtown? I love the um, Chinese elm is a really good one. Um, a few of the slides had them. Greenville's got Chinese elms that they're putting in. We're starting to put some in Greenwood. Um, you can, you can never go wrong with like a good red oak. They're quick growing, um, they're bigger. It just kind of depends on how much space you have and what you need. Um, there are, it's another favorite of mine. Maples are good, but we can't all do maples. You gotta be a little bit further north on that. Um, those are some of my, I, I'd go with an oak. I'd go with one of the elms, um, just in terms of vitality and kind of, Shade and quick growing and quickest impact. Mm -hmm. What about for low, uh, low uh, planting perennials or uh, in a, uh, some of our Main Street communities have um, landscaping to, to negotiate traffic? Sure. And you need to keep it low? Yep. Uh, but I never know how to advise people what you think to maintain. Sure. The, the best solution to that is a, the drift rose, which is the knockout rose's cousin, and it blooms year-round, and it's going to stay this low. Daylilies are a great option in that case. Um, is a perennial, an iris, a little, coneflowers can get a little big, but daylilies, iris, um, the drift rose, a lot of times just a good old-fashioned liriope or monkey grass works well. A smaller ornamental grass where you get that softness but you can you can achieve a lot with a well-placed monkey grass with that keeping it low Would any other do's or don'ts of the hanging baskets um just know that when you get that up in the air you are subjecting not just the plants but the roots to air and roots they've just you've got to maintain that moisture so um, do I would make sure that it's wrapped in a good solid coconut cloth if it's like an exposed basket. Um, look into the self-watering option. Make sure that you've got somebody or a watering truck that can water it. That, that gentleman that I have a photo of, he was going through and he was hitting the, he had the hose to get up to the tall ones. Um, just know that those are going to be a higher maintenance than your container on that but look at plants too like a sweet potato vine or things that can handle hot hot heat dry and still give you that impact so just don't put something in there that's going to require a lot of moisture hey i'm oh, sorry is it better to, to water our hanging baskets at night or in the 
first thing in the morning or last thing at night. You, either one is fine. What you don't want to do is the UV rays are so extreme in the middle of the day that they're going to evaporate that water. So first thing in the night, same thing with irrigation systems. If you have an irrigation system, it needs to be going, I'm talking like 5 a.m., 6 p.m. So the later or earlier you can go, the less hot, the less evaporation, which is just the more effective your watering is going to be. Mm -hmm. That's been a case too. Okay, so, but that, it, they look a lot like that. They're probably dead. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. Is there green underneath it? Oh, you're good. Okay. Yep. It, it, it can be a similar effect. So a lot of times what we saw were ones that were already struggling and then the snow came in and wiped them out. But the hawthorns, that's a, that's a success story and an exception to what we've seen because a lot of times with the snow has just wiped them out and we haven't, we haven't seen. But if you do have it and you do have that new growth underneath them, you're in good shape. And props to you for cutting it back and giving that shoot a new chance to grow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cut it back. Make it unpretty and let that little green shoot come in. Yeah, but that, I'm glad you brought that up because that's been a huge, the snow's been a huge issue with the hawthorns as well. So. You're a little further uh, west, aren't you? Um, I, again, I start with kind of your local companies and see, and a lot of times what they can do is you can order a truckload and they'll, they'll send it to me and I'm right next to Arkansas. So they'll, they bring truckloads in. I always sound like a drug dealer because I'm like, I get the good stuff from Florida, you know, and they bring it on a truck, you know, but that's, that's that. You want the long leaf quality pine straw. And so start with talking to your local guys or your local landscape companies and just say, hey, could we set up where we get a truckload a year? And a lot of times these companies, you can, they'll drop a 18 wheeler trailer and then you can just keep it on the public work lot and use it like that. They'll ship it all over. It just might be a little bit more expensive as with everything shipping. All right, thank y'all, that was fun.